Well, hello, Team Healthy, and I'm so ble pleased to be with you once again here today. As you know, I like to bring in different guests at times and uh, have them talk with us about how to uh, figure out this whole world of narcissism. And I have someone straight from the UK, uh, actually Northampton, which is north of London. Am I right, Caroline? Uh, Perfect. Absolutely. We, we have Caroline Swanson. You might notice that she and I have a little difference in accent, but that's okay. Uh, and um, Caroline, you are uh, considered a, a trauma therapist and coach, and you work with people uh, kind of in a, a family systems kind of a setting uh, who are overcoming or uh, trying to come to terms with some of the trauma that's uh, come into their lives because of uh, uh, their uh, association with narcissists. First, thank you for being here with us. Um, tell me a little bit about how this became an interest of yours. I, I know that you've had some experience personally there, and uh, and you parlayed it into uh, your professional life. So what, what's your backstory? Yeah, so it, it definitely wasn't something that I was sitting there as a seven-year-old little girl going, when I grow up, I'm going to be a trauma therapist and help people heal from <laughs> narcissistic abuse. So it definitely wasn't that. And like many probably who find themselves in this type of work, it was through my own experiences. So I was married to a covert narcissist. I was with him for 14 years, married for 12. And when our marriage broke down and the therapist I was seeing at the time said, you know, go and Google narcissist and narcissistic personality disorder. And I'd heard of like the Greek god of Narcissus and I went and Googled it and it was like, oh my goodness. And it all started to make sense. I did not realize I'd actually been in an abusive relationship. And, you know, there was a lot of shame involved with that. I was diagnosed with PTSD, depression, anxiety, lots of panic attacks, self-harm. And I really struggled to start to heal. I was left in a huge amount of debt um, as well. And I'd got two children to, to look after. And it felt really scary. I felt, how could somebody like myself, I'm meant to be, I'm an intelligent woman, I'm a nice person. How could I have ended up in a relationship like this? And as I started to try and heal, I realized I was actually starting to feel worse. I was, you know, watching what he was doing online. I was trying to get him to apologize. And I just got really stuck in this whole abuse cycle and the trauma bond of this. So I actually started to retrain. My background was actually a podiatrist. That, that's um, what I was originally trained in. And I realized that there were so few out there who really understand, understood narcissism through a trauma-informed lens, what was going on in the body, how that all manifested together. So I literally retrained in lots of things like IFS, EMDR, brain spotting, somatic experiencing. And that's kind of what brought me to do what I do today. Well, and, and I think it's so unique that uh, you, obviously you've had your own personal experience, but you also have a medical background, and then you've parlayed it into a, uh, an understanding of the psychological family dynamics. And so what an incredible blend of um, history and training and, and all the rest that has brought you to the place you are right now. Yeah, I think I've always had a deep interest in helping people anywhere. I think anybody who goes into the medical profession does. Um, but I really feel like what I have experienced has brought me to where I am today. I genuinely believe I went through all of that to be here right now with you to try and help as many others as possible, probably like yourself. Now, you've actually written a book, too. Uh, it's called Divorce is My Superpower. And I don't know that I've uh, talked with many people who would use that term superpower uh, as it relates to having been through a divorce. So tell me how you came up with that as a title and, and the mindset that goes with it. I think there's such a negative connotation, isn't there, about divorce? It's a failure, broken home, and it was just a really negative connotation. And having been in an abusive relationship, you know, divorce for me was like an alarm clock. It really woke me up to what was important in my life. You know, I'd been with my ex-husband for 14 years, and whilst we got the two most beautiful children... I realized literally, probably for most of my 30s, I was living in a freeze response without even realizing. So for me, I feel, you know, and this sounds might sound strange, but incredible gratitude to actually what I went through because it actually woke me up to what's actually important in life for me to go and live the rest of my life at a much deeper level. Yeah, there, there are two terms that are phrases that I like to use. Um, uh, one is crisis reveals character. And uh, and you can see what a person is made of by watching how they respond to that. But another one, and this is where you're coming from, it uh, says uh, crisis creates character. 
Correct. And if you look at your crisis in a therapeutic way, it's like, I never would have asked for this, just like you were mentioning, but here I am. Now, what do we do? So Absolutely. Now, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, it was almost like my ex-husband highlighted the wounds that were already within me, you know, and shone a, not even a spotlight, a great big stadium spotlight on those wounds that were already there. So, you know, it gave me an opportunity, you know, from a place of rock bottom. And like you say, you know, I do a lot of positive psychology in the work that I do. And we have a term called post-traumatic growth, very similar to those terminologies, you know, um, finding a deeper meaning and connection in your life, actually because of the trauma that you have been through. Yes. Uh, let, let's um, let's let's kind of uh, get into some of the terms that we use here. When you talk about trauma and yes. trauma bonding, uh, uh, how do you define trauma and then what is a trauma bond? Yeah, so I think trauma is obviously a word we hear a lot nowadays. And I think uh, there's a lot of misunderstanding really about what trauma is. We tend to think of trauma maybe as these big events or people, but actually that's not what the trauma is. Trauma is actually what happens to us and then what happens inside of us. So it's really to do with how our nervous system reacts to external things, events, people, and what we say to ourselves. So for me, for instance, my trauma wasn't the narcissist my trauma was actually I felt not good enough because of the narcissist behavior towards me that was my trauma I can't change the abuse but I can heal the trauma uh I, I actually have uh, written it down in the past that uh your trauma is a response to experiences that are too intense Correct. for your nervous it's system to handle in the moment Correct. Correct. You know, it's our capacity to cope in that given moment. That's why sometimes we could have one thing that happens on a day, you, you lose your keys, and all of a sudden, it's like the end of the world. You know, in that moment, your capacity, your nervous system, it's like one more drop in there, and suddenly you explode. Okay. Yeah. And, and of course, when you're dealing with that narcissistic person, that narcissist brings so much yeah. to the equation. I want to get to that in just a minute. But uh, uh, so we understand what trauma is. What is trauma bonding? Yeah, so trauma bonding is actually a physiological addiction that we have to certain situations. So in this case, a trauma bond is we become physiologically addicted to a narcissist. So there's a narcissistic abuse cycle. So when they're love bombing and everything's great at the start, we start to start to secrete things like serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin. It feels good. But then when the discard phase comes, maybe we challenge them or we ask them questions and they say something back or give us the silent treatment. We then start to produce things like cortisol, adrenaline, and we start to go into a trauma response. That cycle of hormone release, we actually become addicted to. And that's what we actually call a trauma bond. OK, that, and that's fascinating. And then go, going back to what you were mentioning, that when you didn't understand what was going through, uh, it, uh, going uh, on inside of you, that you would check up on him or try to convince him. How does all that fit into the trauma bond? Yeah, because I was always looking for something of the fix of either the serotonin, oxytocin and dopamine that maybe you'd have this epiphany and apologize and suddenly recognize all of this. Or I was actually waiting for him to be abusive back to me or say something. So it's almost like, oh, there it is. He's been horrible in that moment. There's the adrenaline. There's the cortisol. And it was actually my body needed the fix of that cortisol, of the adrenaline, of all of the other hormone secretions, because I'd become physiologically addicted to that. So I was seeking that out almost to give my body a fix. And that is so fascinating to, to understand that. And again, with you coming from a medical background, it's like, it, it makes perfect sense. Uh, let's, let's talk about that narcissistic person. What is it in them that makes them so toxic? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, narcissists are amongst the most deeply wounded individuals. And, you know, caveat here, all the things that I'm saying here absolutely doesn't excuse abuse. This is about the explanation as to why they okay. behave that way. I think it's really important, isn't it, to recognize that this isn't about necessarily feeling sorry or anything else. But the understanding, I think, really helps survivors like this, too. 
So a narcissist is really a deeply wounded individual, and this comes from childhood trauma. So it can be things like they can become a golden child. So, you know, there's so much pressure on them to perform and behave in a certain way. And as such, we don't know the research right now why somebody actually becomes a narcissist per se with sort of neuroscience and brain activity. But we know brain changes start to happen. And they create like a inner child wound, if you so please. And that inner child wound becomes their version of the deepest pain that they could possibly feel. And as human beings, we're built for survival. Sadly, you know, if we want to be happy or wealthy or successful, we have to be intentional with that. The number one role of our body and our brain is actually survival. So if we have a pain or a deep emotional wound, everything in our own inner system becomes about not feeling that wound. Now, if we're using the internal family systems model like this, which is what I integrate into my work, once you have that internal emotional wound, it means it's not dangerous just to be who we are. We have to be somebody else. And this is where we have what are called protector parts that start to come into play. Now, a narcissist protector part can be things like coercive control, gaslighting, manipulation, anger, addictions even. And these become really pervasive in literally every aspect of their life that they are behaving like. But these are actually protector parts of an individual that collectively we could say that then they are a narcissist as well. The problem being with a narcissist is those protector parts of that individual's inner system become so strong, it becomes their false sense of self, which is why as... I've never seen, and I'm sure you haven't, I've never seen any research where we can cure a narcissist. You know, there's medication out there that can dial down a little bit of abusive behavior, but not to the extent they're ever capable of having a healthy relationship. So really a narcissist protect apart become their false sense of self. And we can never get beyond that because there's no sense of ownership. You know, they behave the way that they do because of you. You know, if you weren't like that, then I wouldn't have to behave like this. And that that is them projecting outwardly all of the time their own inner pain. It's less painful to project than to feel it themselves. I am so glad we have this on tape because you just said a mouthful. We're going to have to go back and just, uh, <laughs> you were, you're, it's so accurate what you're saying. Uh, and it's so important for our listeners to understand that these people are coming from their own place of narcissistic injury. Uh, now, it, it, interestingly, I, I want us to just kind of take a look at some of the things that narcissists will toss or, or um, perform or whatever you want to do with you uh, that um, is, is part of their toxicity, which then goes into their bonding with you. Uh, first, uh, you, you implied because of their false self and their... Um, uh, need for uh, defense and all of that, uh, that narcissists don't know how to trust. No, uh, they don't. And, dangerous to them to trust because there's a potential of pain. Right. And, and, and so they're in their injury, they're trying to protect themselves from that vulnerability. Um, how does that play out their inability to trust? How does that play out with that person in their presence? Yeah, so so they if they don't want to feel that pain, they will behave or uh, blend with a protector part to get what they need in that moment. So everything for them is driven about minimizing, distracting, soothing them away from feeling their narcissistic injury, their, their inner child emotional wound. How that then transcends with somebody else, say like me being in a relationship with somebody... I would also have my own emotional wounds, my emotional pain. And of course, as a codependent in that scenario, that lack of self-love, my protector parts would be things like people pleasing. If I please everybody else, if I please the narcissist, they're going to behave in a certain way, which of course they do at the start because they love me pleasing them. That soothes the narcissist wounds at the start. It soothes my wounds at the start. But it doesn't end well at some stage because, of course, at some stage, it isn't enough for the narcissist. It's uh, yeah, just it's like feeding an empty hole. Uh, OK. <laughs> and, and then uh, knowing that they can't trust um, out of that comes their craving and insistence upon being in control. Uh, yeah. what, what are some of the common signs uh, that you watch for that says that's going on? Yeah, so so they will never take any ownership. So if you say are in a relationship with a narcissist and you've noticed something or you've seen something, 
then they can start to gaslight you. So you might ask a question and they'll really diminish it or say, well, that didn't happen or you're so sensitive or oh, not this again. They won't take any ownership of anything you ask. So you'll ask them a question, but it'll be about how you ask the question, not actually what the question okay. is. So and accurate. Yeah, and it just leaves you. And again, this comes back to the trauma piece, the sensations in the body. You start to feel activated in the body because it's taking you back to your inner child wounds of feeling unheard, unseen, all of the attachment wounds that we have as well. So you might then start to react back or you might go into a freeze response, which many people do in narcissistic relationships. They'll just be in a perpetual freeze response, numbing out, isolating themselves and feeling totally dissociated. Okay. And then taking it a little bit further, not, not only do they uh, uh, have their own inner neediness, et cetera, uh, but then these people, uh, once they realize, hey, you're not getting in, you're not getting with my program here, then they can go deeper and deeper into their anger and their own woundedness. And it comes out as punishing you or being humiliating toward you. Uh, yeah. Can you talk about what you've uh, experienced or, or have uh, observed with other individuals relative to that? You know, anytime a narcissist behaves in a way and you notice an escalation in their behavior, at that point, it's actually when their inner child wounds are hurting the most. It's their nervous system actually doing a great job for them, trying to protect them in the moment to try and soothe and diminish how they are feeling. So like you say, that can come out as, you know, control, manipulation, but on a whole other level, because their nervous system and the protector parts that are coming up need to show up in a certain way. Way, need to make sure that I know I'm now in control. I know I am now in that powerful position to diminish how they are feeling. It doesn't matter how the other person is feeling. It's all about the survival for the narcissist in that moment to not feel their deepest pain. Yeah, they're in constant compensation mode, aren't they? Correct. 100%. I always knew with my ex-husband, if I got, you know, more abusive emails or texts off him at some stages, it was probably, I'd think, okay, he's probably had an argument with his wife at this stage and he's seeking what, supply what, from somebody well, else. And you know what? That's so important to, to because yeah, you're over there thinking, what did I do? Hold on, I'm just sat watching the TV tonight. What's this? You know, well, so and, and uh, the, the answer to that question is I just showed up or I exist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they just uh, use you as their deposit for whatever garbage they can't come to terms with on the inside. Okay, so you mentioned just a moment ago that the recipient of this abuse and the trauma uh, starts questioning oneself. Uh, you said, well, sometimes you go into the people-pleasing mode or you uh, can argue back. So what's going on inside the, the recipient that uh, that makes them more susceptible and vulnerable to that bond? Yeah. So, so what goes on inside of them? So those of us who end up in narcissistic relationships, we also have our own inner child wounds. You know, we have perceived or interpreted our parents, caregivers behavior in a certain way. I'm not good enough. I'm not important. And that creates an emotional wound in us. And everything about our nervous systems then is about not feeling that. So we will tend to have like protective parts, like people pleasing and um, procrastination, perfection. You know, I was as a young child, I was this people pleasing, high achieving perfectionist because I had a core wound of not feeling good enough. Of course, that was because of my father being unemotional and not and saying not things like I'm proud of you. Or, I love you. And my interpretation of that was it must be because of me, because as children, we're very egocentric. It revolves around us. That then transcended into my relationships in adulthood because my version of normal love, particularly with a man, because this was with my father, was to feel not good enough. That felt familiar to me. It almost felt my version of safe. However, what that meant was that my system was constantly trying to have corrective experiences to heal myself. But what was happening is I was attracting the wrong people into my life and it was actually wiring in even more that I wasn't good enough. As as a young adult, you just fell back on what had been familiar to you. Correct. Yeah, it was my version of normal love. That that felt normal to me, even though cognitively I knew it was toxic. This is the difference between the trauma piece. I knew it was toxic. I knew it wasn't right. But my body was craving that feeling that was normal to my body. It felt safe. Oh, you, you make so much sense. Now, th there's a, there's a um, a phrase that says your your body keeps the score. Correct. Yeah, Bessel uh, van der Kolk. Great book. <laughs> okay. So, um, now as somebody who has that uh, that 
uh, medical background, what do you notice are some of the most common ways that the body reacts that illustrates that uh, it indeed is being impacted by the trauma bond? Yeah, there's so many different things. I mean, I teach a lot around, um, you know, how our nervous system works, where we have what we call our ventral vagal part of our nervous system, when we feel calm and present, our social engagement system. Then we have the fight flight response which is our sympathetic where we produce more cortisol in anticipation of fighting or running away and then the freeze response you tend to find people that are in abusive and narcissistic relationships maybe at the start they might go into a trauma response of fight flight because they're trying to argue and they're trying to say well hold on this isn't right but that is still their version of normal love. So they'll stay in that relationship, but that doesn't mean the emotional wound isn't hurting. So the nervous system adapts then to try and protect in that moment so people will move into a freeze response. So there's different physiology that can happen. So the fight flight response is very edgy. We're kind of like this. And then when we're in a freeze response, we're kind of really morose. We have our posture coming forward. And most people I see that are in narcissistic relationships we will suppress our emotions. So again, if you think when we're talking about the container of us, if you think about us as human beings having a container, which is our nervous system, again, those of us that have been in narcissistic relationships are fearful of being judged by others. We're driven by validation from other people. So what we will do is we will suppress our natural biological responses because we're worried what we people will think. But that actually suppression makes our container much smaller. So many people get stuck in a freeze response, but with a really high sympathetic fight flight charge, wanting to come up, wanting to heal. So we tend to be in these freeze responses and then we explode and then we suppress again. And actually yeah. this ends up leading to long-term chronic illness and disease because we're not naturally completing trauma responses in our body we're suppressing them all of the time so the by, by the way just so you know i actually have uh three words under that question that i just asked you and the three words are fight flight and freeze <laughs> there you go <laughs> so it's like, there we go <laughs> Oh, so the implication is that when you're uh, when you uh, observe yourself and you feel yourself in that kind of of mode something has to change and as you are also insinuating it's not going to come from the side of the narcissist so that something has to come from within you so really what, what do you focus on when you're working with your clientele that will help them get beyond this fight flight and freeze response so a lot of this is a lot because I focus a lot on the body. So using things like somatic experiencing and IFS and brain spotting, it's really about the sensations in our body. It's holding space for people to actually have completion of response cycles. Because when we are reacting to a narcissist, we're not actually in the present moment. We're coming from past wounds. We're kind of reliving things on a daily basis as opposed to remembering. So when I'm working with clients, it's about having corrective experiences. It's about allowing the body in a very titrated way with the nervous system to process the past so that we're almost with parts of our brain time stamping things into the past so that you can feel very present you know I am safe now not I'm this little girl who doesn't feel good enough and that's why I'm reacting in this moment because the narcissist is triggering my core wounds so it's really about sensations in the body and giving space and allowing that processing to happen all the time whilst creating attunement, safety, the frame, because sometimes people you work with have never been in a safe relationship. So the therapist client relationship is really, really important or being in a supportive community. So people know that they're seen, they're heard, they're not crazy. It's giving them the understanding and, and understanding that trauma can be healed. We can never change the abuse that the narcissist has perpetrated but we can 100% work on the trauma that has come because of all of that too, because that's about your power. Your power is in not changing the narcissist. Your power is in processing what has happened in your past so your nervous system can now feel safe in the present moment. You're not reliving things from the past. Well, and, and, and that's so crucial for people to understand. You have to learn how to bring yourself into your now and we have yeah. words like mindfulness and things like that. Yeah, you know, in fact, one of the things that uh, that I wanted to ask you about is I, I've talked with so many people who have been traumatized, and uh, they can have all the, uh, the the symptoms of that, whether it's flashbacks or anxiety, and you know, like you say, that frozen reaction. Um, it, it, if a person says, well, 
But Caroline, my situation was so difficult. I think that I'm doing well. I may go weeks and months and I'm, I'm pretty good. And then boom, something happens and I'm triggered. So does that mean, well, I, I guess uh, the healing just didn't happen after all. Yeah, I th and I think this is about expectation of what healing is. I think lots of people think healing is this magical nirvana destination where you're going to wake up one day and go, oh, I'm healed. Yeah. And sadly, that doesn't happen. You know, healing is a lifelong journey. It's a destination. It's it's this journey we go on. It's not this destination. And it's just about going deeper. Healing is not about never being triggered again. Healing is about the awareness as quickly as we can to notice we are triggered to bring us back into a state of presence. And this is a lot around then teaching our nervous system flexibility so it can stretch, not really be stressed. And we're going into those trauma responses. We can have awareness of, okay, I'm noticing some sensations. I think I'm being triggered right now. Let me feel my feet on the floor. Let me look around the room. And really navigating and sort of working on turning your vagus nerve all the time, working on that nervous system. So we're creating almost a bigger container for if things happen, we're still able to cope better. So, uh, <laughs> oh, and, and so there's there are a a multitude then of um, variables that we have to look at when we're trying to help somebody heal. Yes, absolutely, because there can be offshoots of everything. You know, my core emotional wound was definitely I'm not good enough. But as I've done more work and and will continue to to do work till the day I die, it's kind of morphed into I was unlovable to then I'm not important. You know, I have a very strong anger part sometimes that comes up if I feel someone's not listened to me. There's a trigger sometimes when I can feel my anger part wanting to take over to be my voice feeling unheard. You know, but I'm grateful to that part of me because it's trying to protect me with positive intentions, albeit sometimes destructive impacts. So we all have these parts of us. That's why I love family systems. You know, we all have these parts that are working really hard for us to minimize and distract and soothe us away from feeling what our core wounds are. And, you know, as our wounds get smaller, they calm more in our system. But it doesn't mean that they're going to be gone forever. They're just yeah. going to be aware and they'll show up as and when we need them, you know, so... It's, it's like you say, it's a lifelong process. Uh, one of the things that I strongly emphasize is I can't afford to allow that narcissistic person to define me. Absolutely. And, and the more we keep going back thinking, I've got to get that person to understand. Well, <laughs> the implication is because then if they do, then uh, that, that helps me down the road. They're in charge of my emotional disposition. Yeah, that's like you drinking rat poison and expecting the rat to die. It's not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what a, what a, whoever came up with that one, yeah, they were I know, on I love it. it. <laughs> well, it, 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 it speaks. So it, part of it means that you have to kind of um, reparent yourself or reorient yourself to yeah. what your new normal is going to be. And, uh, you, you know, uh, one of my mantras, uh, Dr. C stands for DRC, dignity, respect, and civility, learning to, to live inside of those kind of healthy ingredients in the now. I love that. And that's the whole trauma piece. It's the processing and the integration. And like you say, that reparenting, going back and giving our inner child that which they didn't receive and reinforcing that so we you know many of us when we come out of these re relationships we we know we're good enough we know that but our body is going we don't feel that so that's yeah. why we have to go back and so we can't change what's happened to us but we can change the somatic experience of what's happened to us so for me that little girl now knows she still had the same experience but her interpretation that was not feeling good enough, she now feels that she was good enough. And that means then in the present, I don't have those parts coming up so much for me trying to protect a core wound that is no longer there. So your your cognitions, the way you think uh, can indeed impact your physiology. 100%. And, and a lot of people think we think first and then we feel. It's actually the other way around. There's something called neuroception, which is we we feel and then we add perception and discernment and that's how we react. You know, what we want to do is really have that interception. So we're really noticing what we're feeling. We're working with our nervous system because our nervous system and our body is always working for us. It might not feel like it sometimes, but it's always working for us to try and minimize us feeling what our yeah. nervous system will think would be even more more painful even though we're in pain our nervous system thinks well if I wasn't being like this in fight flight or freeze or with these parts 
it would be even more painful for you. So we've got to get curious about, well, what's that other pain? So so each time a person feels, let's say, angry or guarded or anxious, then the question needs to be, what is my body trying to tell me right now? Absolutely. You know, anger, anxiety, these are all fight, flight, sympathetic responses in our body to our perception of danger. Well, if we know we're not in any actual danger, as in we're not going to die, then why are these parts of us showing up? What is it? And it's there because of some inner child wound that these parts are trying to distract and soothe us from feeling. Caroline Swanson, you are an absolute gem. Uh, Thank you so much for being with us here today. And and, uh, this is one of those interviews that I suspect uh, our people are going to go back and have to listen to more than once because you (laughs) packed so much information in this short time. Um, To to the members of Team Healthy, I I hope that you're hearing Caroline's heart. She's been through it. Uh, She's written about it. And she shares what she's been through in a healthy and constructive way. So uh, I, I hope that this is something that uh, that you'll take note of, and you too can be that kind of person that says, well, uh, none of us are perfectly healed, but I'm in process, and, and anybody that would like to join me on that path is welcome to come along. Absolutely. Uh, Caroline, is there any final word that you of, of encouragement that you want to offer before we wrap up? I just think, you know, trauma is not a life sentence. We can work and, you know, however slow, sometimes we have to slow down to speed up. A lot of people go too fast with their nervous system, you know, one day at a time, one drop at a time, that that's enough. And it isn't your fault. And, you know, collectively and together, you know, we can really help and support each other. Oh, thank you so much. This is Caroline Swanson. I'm so pleased that you've been my guest here. I hope we have a chance to engage more down the road. So yeah. And and thank you so much for your writing and for your, you're on Instagram and YouTube and um, uh, many of those other uh, platforms. And, and so uh, we'll have some connections uh, that we'll uh, let our listeners know how they can get in touch with you as well. Uh, Once again, thank you so much, Caroline. It's been my pleasure to have you as our guest. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Okay.